Hello, I'm Tom and welcome to this month's Film School. So firstly I'd like to say a massive thank you. A lot of people saying well done and getting in front of the camera and that they're really looking forward to this segment so thank you very much for your support. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break a promise. Last month I said we'd talk about my five top tips that I had in Nathan's magazine and I do want to do that because I definitely want this segment to be about the whole of filmmaking not just equipment. However I'm getting a lot of questions about kit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to address both. I'm going to address the first tip that I had and we're also going to look at some equipment today. So hopefully you get the best of both worlds. So my first tip from Nathan's Getting Into Adventure magazine was quite simply commit yourself to making a film. Now to be fair this might sound quite strange. Of course if you're going and you're taking a camera you're going to make a film, that's great. But if you want to make a really good film that tells a really good story it's a lot of hard work, more than you probably realise. So let me start with an example. I was a cameraman on Graham Hoskins and Danny John Jules' second TV series, Dakar Dreams, and it was my job to film the trip and make sure that we got a good story at the end of it. And this meant a lot of commitment. The first thing is that I was always up first. I had to be up, I had to have my kit packed away, my bike ready to go, so that I could film them in the morning, so that if anything interesting happened while they were making breakfast, while they were packing up their tent, I was always there to be able to capture the footage. During the days of filming, I would spend hours riding on my own because I was riding ahead, waiting to find that amazing vista so I could stop and film them as they went past. And then as soon as they went past, I had to catch up with them again, get past them and get ahead of them. So I wasn't part of the group in terms of the riding. Of course, then we get to the end of the day. Everyone's packed up, everyone goes to bed. Me, I'm still sitting there, I'm backing up footage, getting my batteries charged, cleaning my lenses, making sure everything is ready for the next day. Now, of course, there are exceptions. You get Nick Sanders, who films all of his trips on his own. But again, you've got to think about his trip is very, very different. If he wants to film that great shot of him coming over the rise in a cloud of dust on his motorbike, what he's actually had to do is ride up there first, set up the camera, ride back, turn around, ride past the camera, stop, ride back, pick up the camera, stop recording. But the main crux of it is this. You don't have the same experience as everyone else. While everyone else is looking at these fantastic vistas or interacting with local people or helping someone who's broken their bike, you aren't experiencing any of this you are sitting back watching it through a little screen. And that is how you will experience your trip. And it's very, very different and sometimes very hard to do. And this is where most filmmakers fall down. They get too engrossed in the trip. And they only pick up the camera when there's time. And of course, when there's time, there usually isn't anything interesting happening. Now, I by no means want to put anyone off trying to film their adventure. But I think it's very important you decide what you want from that adventure. I go on these things specifically to film and I understand that I won't have those interactions and it will be a very different adventure for me. Is that the kind of adventure you want? Because you don't want to come back regretting the fact that you haven't experienced the adventure or the trip or the travelling that you wanted to in the way you wanted to just because you felt you should make a record of it. However, for me, one of the best things about my adventures is coming home and being able to make a fantastic film that I can then share with others. For me, that's a reward. But for others, not so. So you need to think about it very carefully. OK, now let's move on to kit. I'm going to talk about cameras today. I'm going to talk about helmet cameras and I'm going to talk about your main filming camera for a trip. Now the question I always get asked is, should I pay three, four hundred quid for a GoPro? My honest opinion is, no. I'm not going to lie, I have two of them myself and I use them and they are fantastic, but they are pricey. Nowadays you can get far, far cheaper cameras that give you full HD quality, so why pay more? Now the GoPro does have some benefits, definitely it has a much higher end lens and you tend to find the sensors a bit better which gives you slightly sharper quality and a, a better look to your footage. However, Helmet cameras are massively overused. I can't tell you how many times someone has sent in a film for us to put on Travel Journal and it's been 45 minutes 
of helmet camera shots. Now don't get me wrong, there are people out there who have made entire films just on helmet cameras alone, and they look fantastic. Broken Tooth in Canada is one of my favorites. He makes some amazing travel films. However, he is incredibly creative on how he uses it. Most people stick it on their helmet and that's it. I'll cover this a bit more when we talk about how to tell a story in next month's show, but it's really important that helmet cameras are just used as a linking passage, something very short to cut to, just to give people an idea. It should never be your main source of visual footage. And for that reason, don't spend loads of money on it. You can get these fantastic 1080p cameras for 60, 70 pounds, it'll do a brilliant job, and they have all the same GoPro mounting, so you can get all of the accessories that you have with a GoPro. And honestly, they're the best way to go in my opinion. You also have the added bonus that you can be a bit more adventurous with your shots. Because the camera is only 60, 70 pound, you're not worried about putting it somewhere it might get damaged because for that price you can buy another one. If you've spent three, 400 pound on a GoPro, you get a bit precious about it. So that's my opinion on helmet cameras and GoPros specifically. By all means, if you've got any questions, feel free to fire them at me. I'm sure lots of people will not agree with me. But now let's talk about your main camera for filming. Now, when I go on a trip and I'm on a bike, of course I need to pack small and I need to get as much as I can out of the cameras that I use. So there are two main cameras I take and I tend to take one or the other, I don't take both. The first camera, and actually the camera that's filming this right now, is this. It is the Canon XF100. It is a fantastic small camera, uh, really nice lightweight, really easy to use, has full auto settings so you can literally just sit here have all the autofocus done for you without any problems, but it has the flexibility of being able to go manual as well. So you can play about with the settings and try and get a bit of a nicer feel and look for your footage. However, it has one massive advantage over the other camera that I'm about to show you, and it's this. It's the XLR inputs for microphones. Now this will give you far, far better sound quality when you're filming. The downsides of it, it's not particularly cinematic. It doesn't have that depth of field uh, that other cameras will give you. Uh, it makes the image a bit flat, but at the same time, it's so easy. It's point and shoot uh, with fantastic sound quality and uh, a whole range of manual settings. So yeah, definitely a fantastic bit of kit, this. So the other camera that you use quite a lot is digital SLR. Now I've used a couple of these. I've used the Sony Alpha 77 and this one, which is the Canon 700D. So there are many advantages to a digital SLR. The first one being it takes standard SD card media, which a lot of cameras do these days. It just means that basically wherever you are in the world, you're going to be able to find memory cards if you need them. Second of all, you can take some fantastic stills, which means that you don't have to take a second stills camera with you, making sure that your kit is kept to a minimum. One really nice feature on the 700D is the flip out screen, so you can turn it around and you can see yourself when you're filming. However, the main benefit of a digital SLR is the quality of the image. Now they both film in 1080p, both this and the Canon XF100, but the interchangeable lenses on this mean you get a much, much better depth of field. This means the images you get are far more cinematic and they look a bit better. However, the autofocus feature on here is a push button and it does have trouble sometimes finding that focus and it isn't always as quick as the autofocus on a Canon XF100. So you'll find yourself setting up shots and using the manual focus a lot more. But if you spend the time to get to know your camera before you go on these trips, the footage that something this will give you will be far, far more cinematic. Now I'm going to be leaving details of this camera, the Canon XF100, the GoPro equivalent that I recommend, and actually all the other kind of kits I recommend taking with you on a trip as a basic filming kit in the link below. The links in the description will take you to CVP's website. CVP don't sponsor this segment, maybe one day they will, but at the moment they don't. But I'm sending you there because personally I found their customer service to be the best. They're happy to talk through kit, they're happy to offer advice wherever they can, and they also price match, so you shouldn't have any issues. Um, so highly recommend those guys, but the most important thing is you get some kit and you get filming. That's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Film School. If you have any questions, please send them in, and what I'll do is I'll try and answer them in next month's show. Thanks a lot. See you soon.